right now. Come on, why don't you just in your own way exalt and elevate him in your life tonight. You are so worthy of our worship and so worthy of our praise. And so we bless you tonight. You are God and beside you there is none other. And all the glory and all the honor and all the praise belongs to you in Jesus' name. Church shout amen. Come on, give God praise. Bless God for the praise team. Amen. Go ahead and be seated in the presence of the Lord. Um, I, th I think most of you uh, who are a little bit older, I was in New Jersey uh, preaching last night. And uh, yesterday afternoon, I had the opportunity to um, spend just a few minutes uh, with one of my dear friends. We've been friends for decades and um, got a chance to spend some time with him. He's now in his 43rd year pastoring the same church. He's only pastored one church, went there as a young man, and uh, has been there, grown that church tremendously. It's one of the great churches in New Jersey, and he and I got to spend some time together, and uh, while we were talking, we started laughing because we realized as we were, as we were sitting there talking that um, we have become the old men. Now, that's not funny. Um, we were talking about, you know, remember when, and, and I thought, man, we old. And I thought about that because when you're old, uh, all your stories are old, all your jokes are old, and you're kind of scared to tell them in public because young folk have no idea what you're talking about. And uh, I was thinking about that, Uncle Marty, in relationship to the, the message tonight. There's an, everybody say old story. There's an old story. Most of you Patrick's heard it. It's an old story. So Patrick's heard this story. Gamble, not you, has heard this story. It's about a, about a young musician who gets off the subway in Midtown Manhattan. And he asks someone, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? Now you got to know what Carnegie Hall is. And um, someone answers him. Practice, baby, practice. <laughs> you got to be old to get it. <laughs> now, he wanted directions to Carnegie Hall, but the answer was still true. If you want to play at Carnegie Hall, you got to practice, baby, practice. And what that gentleman said to that young budding musician is really what Paul says to us tonight, that if we want to grow in God, there are some things we got to practice. That, that growth in God does not come, now I need you to hear this, because this Tyrone is where younger generations are missing it. And, and it's where younger generations often get frustrated, not only with spiritual things, but with life itself, because younger generations have grown up in an age of instant everything. Our microwaves, come on, y'all, computers, tweeting, texting, email, Gmail, they've grown up. So if they send something, they text it, 140 characters, they push a button, and instantly somebody gets it, and in about three seconds, someone is replying. That See, now when I was growing up, it didn't work that way. And so, so they pop stuff in the microwave. It's instant. They pull up to McDonald's. They pull up to Burger King. Their dinner is served through a window. And that's fine for lunch and dinner. But life doesn't work that way. And marriage doesn't work. Okay, y'all getting quiet. 
And neither does your walk with God work that way. There's no such thing as getting saved tonight, becoming a Christian of growth, maturity, ability tomorrow morning. There is a process and there are some things you have to practice. You don't become a mature believer overnight. You don't become a stable, solid believer overnight. You don't become a seasoned saint overnight. There is a process, and there are some things. Would you look at a neighbor and say, practice, baby, practice. You just got to practice them. And, and that's, what, that's what Paul really is saying when he writes to the church at Colossae. In fact, if you look at that book, you'll discover that the church at Colossae, the Colossian saints, are being inundated with false doctrine. Uh, these teachers have come in to the church at Colossae and they are trying to convince them that having Christ by himself is not enough. And so they try to do a synchronism uh, where they take the practices of other religions and couple them with the practices of the Christian faith because there, there are these believers, these these false teachers who are saying it's not enough to have Christ. You got to have something else. Now, can I say this and you won't get mad? That same spirit was not just in the first century. It's in the 21st century. And if you and I are not careful, we can succumb to these spirits that say it's not enough that you have Jesus. You got to have Jesus in Buddha. You got to have Jesus in Allah. You got to have Jesus in Zen. You got to have Jesus in this. But is there anybody here on a Saturday night who knows we just sing it that in Christ alone is everything you need? Would you tell a neighbor and say, neighbor, all I need is in Jesus. And Jesus is all I need because Jesus is my healing. Jesus is my peace. Jesus is my joy. Jesus is my hope. Jesus is my power. Okay, I'm losing y'all. Jesus is my life. I don't need anything else. When I have Christ, I have all I need. And so Paul, are y'all still with me? So Paul Shannon writes to the saints at Colossae and says, I know that you're being infiltrated and inundated with this philosophy of synchronism where they're trying to sync other religious practices with faith in Christ. And Paul says, I want you to stand firm. Boy, I, I could say that to us tonight. I want this church to stand firm. I don't ever want you moved from what you've been taught and what you know to be true and what has blessed you this far. Don't throw away your faith for something that's not tested, tried, or proven true. Anybody here know that God does work? Okay, let me, let me try it again. Is there anyone here tonight who knows that Christ has made the difference in your life and to walk away from him is to walk away from the greatest thing you've ever had? Paul says, I want you to stand firm. I want you to be steadfast. I want you to be unmovable. Always abounding might in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And then Paul moves from the theoretical and the theological to a praxis of what I would call practicality. He says, don't live like you used to live. <laughs> and he lists all those things, Larry, that we used to do. Can I ask this real quick? Don't Now, don't tell it, just... She's shaking her head, say, please don't ask us. Did any of you see yourself in any of those things on that list? Somebody said the host to live. 
And now I want you to, everybody say practice. I want you to practice a new way of living. I want you to show to the world, watch this, watch this, in the midst of this synchronism, this attempt to blend other religions and other practices with faith in Christ, I want you to show the world the difference Christ has made in your life. And I want you, here's what I'll be teaching on all weekend. I want you to practice, baby, practice. And there are six, hold on, six. I just realized I can't do that with a, with a mic in my hand. One more time. There are six. There are six things I want to deal with. I'm going to deal with two tonight, two at eight, two at ten. All right? Everybody say six practices. Now, I'm, I'm telling you now, the more I worked on this, the more I think I got a book here. Because this, this, these principles and practices are so powerful. So I'm going to give you two practices tonight. I know I won't see you tomorrow, so get to see these. Because you will not I'll say, well, I see you tomorrow. You will not be here tomorrow. So, so just get the CD. Or get online, amen? And uh, you can get them. Okay, here's the first one. The first Practice. Everyone say practice. The first practice that you and I ought to be putting in action, in activity in our lives, is the practice of prayer. Now, now beloved, beloved, few things, if any, are more essential, more important to the growth of a Christian than is the practice and the habit of prayer. Boy, I should have got a better amen than that. No, I'm going to try it again. I'm going to say it again. Come on, a few things, if any, are more important, more essential to the growth, the development, the maturation of a believer than is the habit and the practice of prayer. Now, now, now one more time, tell a neighbor, say, neighbor, when you're old, you tell old stuff. All right? So when I was a boy growing up, I was blessed to grow up in a generation in the church that believed, no, you ought to hear how I said, believed in the power of prayer. Then was some praying for, now they would be busting verbs. they be, come here for a minute, son. I, he, he came in off stage with this shirt on. T turn around. God Say that, then, then done, did it again. That's how they pray. That's how they, Lord, I want to thank you one more time, once and again. <laughs> you know, brought us through toils, trial. They couldn't say tribute. Because <laughs> he got what them saints were saying. We grew up in a generation that believed in the power and the practice and the practicality of prayer. And can I say to you tonight, and I got to hurry on, if you're going to make it in this Christian life in 2017 and beyond, you better learn how to pray. Bible teaches us the essential nature of prayer. Luke 18, 1, Jesus says men ought always to pray and not to faint. Someone said if you don't pray, you will faint, but if you pray, you'll never faint. Matthew 17, 21, Jesus says some things go out but by prayer. Matthew 6, 5, Jesus says when you pray. Okay, y'all missed it. Matthew 6, 5, Jesus says, when you pray, not if you pray. Jesus does not assume that for you and I, prayer will be a luxury or an option. He doesn't say if you pray. He says when you pray. So I want to look at three things about prayer. First of all, are you ready? What is prayer? Ask your neighbor, what is prayer? Okay, here's the first thing, real quick. Prayer is communication with God. Wow, that's real good. That's real good. Now, okay, I'm going to come back to something in a minute, and Brenda. Here's the next one. Prayer is communion with God. 
And then here's, here is C. Prayer is a commitment to God. So prayer is communication with God. So everyone say prayer is a communication with God. Everyone say prayer is communion with God. And prayer is a commitment to God. Now, 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 beloved, let me say this very quickly, and I've got to move on. I have a lot of ground to cover. Let me say this very quickly. I want you to get out of your mind, if you can, the prayers of men and women you admired, but whose prayer style has haunted you and hurt you. Because you are trying to sound like some deacon and you can't get the words right. You don't know whether your bed was your cooling board or your ironing board. You don't know. <laughs> what did he say my bed was? <laughs> you don't have to use a lot of flowery phrases. You don't have to impress God with how well you can talk. You don't have to use a bunch of multi-syllable words to show God how intelligent you are. God made knowledge. God is knowledge. God made words. Words don't impress God. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire uttered or unexpressed. And how many of you know that? What is prayer, church? Prayer is, it is, and it is, all right, here's the second question. Now that we've answered what is prayer, how do we pray? Now let me give it to you. I already touched on it. A, we pray sincerely. One of the wonderful things I love about prayer is I can tell God, I can't tell you, but I can tell God how I really feel. Thank God I don't tell you. But I can, the other day I was uh, telling God something and I told, I told the Lord, I'm glad this is just between you and me. And then I asked him the silliest question in the world. Can, can I tell you something? <laughs> That's Silly things I ask God. Can I tell you something? Pray, you, you pray sincerely. Now I'm going to say something to you, and please hear my heart. Stop praying stuff you don't mean. Stop praying stuff you're not ready for. My wife and I, before, we weren't married yet, I don't think. Were we married? We've been married so long, I don't know. It all blends together. Um, I don't think we were married. There was a lady. I'm not going to call her name because she has family in this church. Uh, she's in heaven now. And we were at West Middlesex. We weren't married. She was at West Middlesex. And she was singing this song, um, Take My Houses, Take My Land. Take, and she was just a singing this. She was just crying. And I looked at the and I said, I ain't singing that. I said, no, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. I haven't gotten one yet. I don't want God to take it. I ain't got a house yet. I want a house. Oh, no, I want high. I want some land. I want some money. Hey, no, she was just, they just crying and snotting and, you know, and I looked at first lady. She wasn't first lady, but I said, I ain't singing that. I'm not singing that. I ain't singing that. No, that ain't my testimony. Now, and 40 some years later, I'm trying to get there, but I still can't sing it all the way through. I can sing the chorus. It's that third verse that messes me up. Pray sincerely. All right? Here's, here's the second thing. Pray simply. Pray simply. Now, I'm going to liberate you in prayer because so many men say to me, well, pastor, I have trouble praying. But I say, but you, you don't have trouble talking to me right now. Because you think you got to get a prayer tone and a prayer look. You know, your face all wrinkled up. <laughs> get to those church stink face. No, just pray simply. Say, Lord, help me not to knock this person out. <laughs> That's a prayer. <laughs> Lord, uh, hold my tongue, please. That's a prayer. 
Pray sincerely. Pray simply. All right? Now, now he, he, here's the third one. Now, the first two, you know, I want you to feel good about them, but here's the third one, and I want to laser in on this. Um, pray, Dr. Charlene Watkins, strategically. You, you have to learn. I'm going to use a big word, Andy, only one I want to use tonight. You have to learn how to pray with specificity. But in praying with specificity, you must also pray strategically. All right. Um, so, so, so when when you're praying for your children, um, if you have more than one child, no, no two children are alike. You you can't just pray, Lord bless my children, okay? Because they are different places in life. They need different things. So you must be strategic in how you pray. Uh, Dee Dee and Jossie, they're the only two children I have, but they are like night and day. And so when I pray for them every morning and throughout the day, depending on where they are, what they're going through, I pray for them differently. I pray for our grandchildren differently. You, you have to be, when I pray for you, I don't pray for all of y'all the same way because, because there are times when I must specifically target an area of your life or of my life. When I'm praying for myself, de depending on what season, is this helping anybody? Depending on what season I'm in, it's different how I pray. So I pray sincerely and I pray simply and then I pray strategically. Here's the third question, then we'll go to the next, to the next practice. What does prayer do? We now know what prayer is and we now know how we are to pray. So what does prayer do? There are three things prayer does in the life of the believer. A, prayer allows us, now beloved, if you don't shout on this, your, your clap is broke and your wood is wet. <laughs> prayer allows us to be in the presence of God yeah somebody ought to clap for that I'm, I mean ju just a moment ago uh, Minister Lacey and the team and the minstrels led us in worship that brought us into the presence of God and the same way praise does that watch this Prayer does it as well. In fact, okay, I'm going to say this. It is really how you pray that releases how you praise that determines the level of presence you have. So you can be in the outer court, you can be outside, or you can go into the holy of holies, but it all depends on your prayer life that releases your praise life that ushers you into the presence of Almighty God. Are you in the room with me? One of the great privileges of prayer is I get to go into the presence of God. For eight years, I was blessed maybe, I don't know, six, seven times, go to the White House. And other times, uh, when he came to Columbus, to be in the presence of President Obama. It's a wonderful thing, wonderful thing. But I tell you what, I trade all of that for one hour in the presence of God. No, no, no. Y'all think I'm jiving because guess what? He ain't president no more. But God is still God. And I would trade every visit, every handshake, every conversation. I would trade. Matter of fact, one time, wife and I went to White House and people were trying to get to the president, take a picture. And my wife and I laughed. He looked at me. He said, we got enough pictures. He said, you move. He said, you, well, you got enough pictures with me. I would trade all of that for one hour in the presence of God. No, let me tell you why. Because in the, see, in the presence of the president, I am touched. In the presence of God, I'm transformed. Come on, y'all ain't with me. Y'all ain't with me. Tap a neighbor, say something about his presence. Here's the second thing, prayer. Everyone say prayer. Prayer aligns us with the will and purposes of God. Now, now, let me say this real quick. Prayer is not about you getting God to change his mind. 
Child, I'm going to pray. I'm going to come on, pray with me. I want y'all to agree with me because I want God to turn this around. And I want, see, you really want to bribe God, get God to change his mind. Prayer is not about you making God change his mind. Prayer is about you allowing God to get you aligned with his will, his plan, his purpose for your life. That's why Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, can you hear me my glasses, Pastor? That's why Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane has to pray, not my will, but thy will be done. And then here's C. What's the first thing prayer does? What's the second thing prayer does? Here's C. Prayer, whoo, prayer activates the power of God to work in our lives. Child, you want to see God move? Pray. I, I, somebody you say years ago, I can't remember who it was, you say uh, to me and the others, and I know they were kind of halfway joking, but they meant it too. They'd say, don't make me start praying. Don't make me start praying. And then they say, don't make me get on one knee. And then, and then when they look at me, they say, now don't make me get on both knees. And what they were saying is, if I pray, something's going to happen. If I get on one knee, something else going to happen. But if I get on both knees, I am serious, and something's going to happen real quick. Because when you pray, it activates the power of God at work in your life. And that's why you can't sleep on prayer and you got to ask God to help you stop going to sleep when you pray because you are not releasing the activity of God to work on your behalf. Tell a neighbor, say, neighbor, there's wonderful power in prayer. Now, here's the second practice. What's the first practice? The pra okay, only Pastor Kelly. Of course, Pastor Kelly know it. What's the first practice, y'all? Practice. Why don't y'all answer? What's the first practice? Prayer. Here's the second practice. The second practice we must employ is the practice of Bible study. Now, long, long ago in a land far, far away, when I was a boy, there was a thing called letters. And it required a skill called writing. Y'all looking like, huh? People wrote letters. Y'all looking like, huh? They put them in something called an envelope. They licked something called a stamp. They took it to something called a mailbox. And it was delivered by a mailman. Now, when I was dating my wife, um, she lived in this, matter of fact, I was near her house where she grew up yesterday uh, because the hotel that I was at wasn't far from the Teaneck Hackensack area. Um, and so I was not far. In fact, I said to Clayton, I said, didn't Teaneck down that was exit four? Route 4, down Route 4, and he said, yeah. And um, I remember, because she lived in New Jersey, I lived in New York, we would write each other. And I remember waiting with bated breath <laughs> for letters from my wife. And um, those were exciting. When, when I came home, and there was something in the mail for me. Y'all are missing it. Now I come home and I be praying there is nothing. Because <laughs> everything in the mail is for me. I would read letters from my wife. She was not my wife then. And I would read them over and over and over again. Now, I'm, I'm telling you that to say, when it comes to the Bible, the Bible is really God's letter to us. 
And as believers, beloved, we, Sanders, we ought to be reading it over and over again. So I want to ask three questions about the Bible. Here's the first one. What is the Bible? Here's the first thing. The Bible is the word of God. Did you get what I just said? The Bible is the word of God. Here's the second thing, B. The Bible is the revelation of the works and ways of God. The Bible reveals to me the conduct and the character of God. Uh, the psalmist talks about how he made known his acts or deeds unto the children of Israel, but his ways unto Moses. It's God's character versus God's conduct. It's, it's who God is versus what God does. Now, can I say something and you won't get offended? Most Christians are in love with what God does when you ought to be in love with who God is. Y'all are missing this. Y'all are missing this. So, so watch this. It's like loving your husband because he pays the bills or loving your wife because she cooks. Are y'all with me? You, you ought not love them for what they do. You ought to love them for who they are. And, and some people, I might well say it because y'all ain't helping me know how, some people only love God for the bennies that God gives them and the blessings that God gives them and the benefits that accrue to them, but they don't know how to love God just for who he is, which is why you cannot imagine being in God's presence without asking for something instead of just being there and worshiping him, not for what you want, but for who he already is. Are you in the room with me? Tap a neighbor, say there is a difference between the works of God and the ways of God. So the Bible is the word of God. The Bible is the revelation of the works and ways of God. Here's the next one. The Bible is the means by which we discern and discover the will of God. You want to know what God's will for your life is? Two ways to do it. Pray and read the word. Are you in the room with me? Here's the second question. How do I read the Bible? How do I read the Bible? There are three ways. A, read the Bible with humility. Hallelujah. Read it with humility. Um, I, I've been preaching this thing since j the first Sunday in January 1974. A lot of y'all weren't even living there. In 1974, my trial sermon, first Sunday in January, and I did a little bit of Jack Lake preaching before that, but my first official sermon was the first Sunday in January, 1974, and I opened it last night to speak, and I opened it this morning, and I opened it this afternoon, and I never opened this Bible without a sense of great humility that I am holding the living word of the living God. You don't ever come to God's word flippant and casual and cavalier and careless and indifferent. You come with humility. Here's, this, here's B. We read the Bible with a hunger. Shh. Boy, I wish I had a half a church right there. You, beloved, there, there ought to be in us, there ought to be in us a desire for the word like desire for food. Wow, y'all getting quiet on me. There ought to be an appetite that you develop that only the word of God can fill it. And you come to the word of God with a hunger. Lord, would you feed me out of your word? Would you give me, now, now can I say this, please don't get mad. Sometimes God will give you a whole meal. Sometimes God will give you a morsel. But a morsel is enough to get you through the day. Come on, tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, you don't need to read a whole book of the Bible. If you read one verse and that verse gets alive in you, it will feed you all day long. And then here's the next thing. We, we come to the Bible wanting to hear the voice 
and the word of God. I, I expect, now let me just close and D on this. I expect, now, now, now can I share something with you that, that is, it's a little confessional? Um, because I preach so much, um, I, I used to know how many times I preached in a year. Deacon Didi, I don't even know no more. I stopped counting. I don't know. I've stopped counting how many times I preach in a week. Um, and so, so because I preach so much, I, um, I have to, please, this, this isn't true of you. I'm talking only of me. I, I have to, um, in my devotions, with great intentionality, make sure that I am not reading the word looking for the next sermon. Because there's always a next sermon. So I have to practice in my quiet time. And one of the ways I do it is by reading a totally different Bible than anyone that I, the Bible that I do my devotions and I never preach from it. It's just a little thing I do because it's almost like saying to God, this, is, this time right now is not for that. Right now, I am hungry and I need you to feed me. I'm going to feed the saints, but right now, I'm in the kitchen and I need you to fix me something. Come on, come on. I'm going to feed the saints in a minute, but could you, right now, could you stir up something in that pot? And dip some bread in it and give me just a little something. And when I do that, I am waiting to hear the voice of God, not about you and not about a sermon and not about a eulogy and not about a lecture and not about a speech. I'm listening to hear what God has to say to me as his child, his son, who he loves without a title. I don't come to God with a title. I don't need to be bishop, pastor, realm, doctor. There are moments I just want to be God's son and I just want God to talk to me for me. And I want to hear his voice. Hearing his voice in every line, making each faithful, saying, Mine, not yours, mine. Angela, I want God to speak to me. Would you lift your hands real quick? Say, Father, speak to me. Here's the third thing and I close. What, what does reading the Bible do for me? Well, I, I, can I say that it does something for you? Amen. Here's the first thing it does. Hey, it teaches us. Come on, y'all. The word of God is a mirror. And the word of God is a lamp. And the word of God is a light. And the word of God is instruction. And when you read, now can I say this, and please don't get mad at me. Everything you need to know about anything is in the Bible. Some of y'all are spending all this money for somebody to tell you something, you get it for free if you just cut off power and scandal and read the word of God. The word of God will tell you how to be a good husband or a good wife or a good dad or a good mom or a good son or a good daughter or a good boss or a good worker or a good Christian or a good usher or a good preacher. Whatever you need to know how to handle your money, how to deal with your flesh, how to control your mouth and your temper. The, tell the neighbor the word to tell you all of that. It'll teach you. Here's the second thing. Oh, God, the Bible touches you. Oh, y'all better leave me alone on that one. Have you ever read the Bible and got goosebumps? <laughs> no, some of y'all haven't, but I wish you would. If, have you ever read the Bible and I mean you just got happy? 
and you was glad wasn't nobody in the room with you because you was about to have a Holy Ghost conniption fit and you started just, sometimes you were crying and sometimes you were laughing. I am afraid of anybody who can pick up the word of God and be cold and callous about it because if this thing ever really gets alive to you, it won't just teach you. Somebody holler, it'll touch you. It'll be, okay, I got to go. It'll be like Jeremiah who said, I said I wasn't going to talk about him no more. I said I wasn't going to call his name anymore. I said I was through preaching. I rolled up the scroll. I had put away the law. I wasn't going to talk about him. But his word. Okay, uh -uh, it's Saturday. I do not holler on Saturday. But his word was in me like fire. Shut up in my bones. Has the word of God ever got a hold of you and made you run and wasn't nobody chasing you? Make you laugh and nothing was funny? Make you cry and you wasn't even feeling sad? Have you ever opened up the word and God put a download in your spirit that touched you at a level that nobody else could? Would you lean on a neighbor, say neighbor? Why y'all making me act unseemly on Saturday? Say, neighbor, his word will teach you and his word will touch you, but his word will also transform you because when you've been in the presence of the word and the word gets in you, See, a lot of y'all get in the word, but the word never gets in you. But when the word gets in you, it'll transform your life. It'll change your mind. It'll touch your psyche. It'll deal with your emotions. It'll help your attitude. Somebody holler, transform me. Transformed by grace divine. The glory shall be thine. Henceforth, forevermore, let me be transformed. By the grace, the life, and the power of God. And my time is up. Come on instead. Come on, give God praise for his word. If you and I are serious about our faith, serious about growing in the things of God, there's no way we can avoid or neglect prayer and study of the word. They are practices we must employ. I'll look at two more at eight, two more at ten. Six practices. Colossians chapter three. Paul says, now you put away all that other stuff and you put on a new man. Now you show by practice the change God has made in your life. I want to ask you tonight, how you doing with your prayer life? How you doing with your Bible stuff? Do you have a quiet time with God every day? <coughs> Come on, every day? That's a great song. Who's playing that? Thank you. Speak to my heart, Holy Spirit. It's a great song. Listen, do you have a quiet time with God every day? Do you have a quiet place? Now, now listen to me. Listen to me. <coughs> I was telling Dr. Clayton <coughs> yesterday when I asked him, I said, didn't T-neck write down Route 4? And he said, yeah. And I said, uh, I said, Clayton, <coughs> can I have some water, please? Thank you. I worked real hard last night. I said, Clayton, I said, um, if I had a dollar for every time I got on the subway, the bus, another bus, and then walked, to get to 114 Fairview Avenue, T-Neck, New Jersey, 07666. <laughs> I'd be a pretty well-off dude because there was somebody in that brown house that I wanted to see. And I wanted to be with them. I want you to hear me. And no sacrifice was too great. Now let me ask you, is that how you feel about God? Do, can you imagine me telling First Lady, look, um, meet me halfway. <laughs> now let me say this, because y'all laughing. She'd have done it, because the bruh man was bad. She'd have done it. But, <laughs> but could you imagine me saying that? No. 
I don't know how you tell God you don't have time. How you tell God you're too busy? How you tell God you got too much going on? How you do that? Get a place to meet God and meet him there every day. He's waiting on you. And he'll be there when you show up. Because watch this, Deacon Dowdy, here's the thing. Once you make the appointment with him, he shows up even if you don't. That's what scares me. So I don't care what time, my wife tell you, I don't care what time I got a plane leaving, you know, six o'clock in the morning. My wife tell you, I'll be downstairs. It may only be 20 minutes, but I know he's going to be there waiting on me. And I don't want to leave him standing there saying, what happened to him this morning? I can't go, God, I got an early flight. I need God to keep that plane up in the air. Look, I'm running, but can we talk? <laughs> How's your prayer life? How's your study of the word? You in the word? Is the word getting in you? Word teaching you, touching you, transforming you?